Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Called Out Church. Thanks for being here, listening online. Um, last week, we were talking about the tabernacle. We were talking about the outer court. Today, we're going to be talking about the inner court or the holy place. Don't get this confused with the holy of holies, right? That's even deeper, but the holy place, okay? So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. We thank you for this word. We thank you for showing us all the types and shadows, all the, the different patterns in your ways. And we ask that you help us to understand them in a deeper way and deeper meaning this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I fully expect this, this may take me two weeks to go through, okay? Um, there's just a lot of information within this. Um, so most likely we'll get through two pieces out of the three of the furniture. But before we get there, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to explain a couple concepts. We all know this. We've all heard this. But I just wanted to want to make sure we all understand, right? You can read that Bible all day long, but if we don't understand this concept of spiritual discernment, there's no way you're going to understand it. There's no way you're going to see all these types and shadows and patterns that we are going to read about. It's, it's too hard to really wrap your mind around unless God reveals these things to you. So... Uh, with that said, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13 says this, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For whom has been, or excuse me, for who has known the mind of the Lord that may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, right? Two things, three things to pull out. First and foremost, people out there in the world, right? A lot of times if we're talking about evangelism or something of this nature, knocking on people's doors and all, all of that kind of stuff, how come it doesn't work all the time? Ask yourself that. Why doesn't it work? Well, first and foremost, I want to tell you the Spirit hasn't drawn them, right? God has not called this out as their time for them to be drawn in, right? So they have to have a, a, a calling from God to make them, that curiosity has to be sparked and lit, right? In order for them to start perceiving there is a spiritual thing out there, right? So the Spirit of God's got to get it on them first and going. But still, until they accept Christ and have received the Spirit of God inside them, they're not going to understand all of these deeper things. This is also why we have to understand the concept of milk and solid food, right? Where an early Christian has the ability to start learning, okay? However, the deeper we get into these concepts with God, the more mature they're going to have to be to understand them, right? You got to learn to crawl before you walk. You got to learn to walk before you run. It's that whole concept. And as you grow, right? And here's here's where we have a lot of issues within denominations that renounce even talking about spiritual things, right? Look at this statement, right? Uh but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. So understand this. Can a Christian be foolish in the things of the Spirit? Yes, because he, has, he or she has shut themselves off from listening to what the Spirit has to say. Why? Because it is foolishness to them. Understand, this is not just about those people out in the world. It's a double it's a double whammy here, right? We're talking about people that don't want to know. They want to stick their head in the sand, and they don't want to go no further. We're talking about 
But I like that milk. It tastes so sweet. What do you mean I have to chew? It hurts my teeth. You see what I mean? So, okay. So let's keep going here. Oh, um, and let no one judge you. If you're listening to what God has for you and what God leads you in and tells you to do, all your friends, Christians included, are going to be like, are you out of your mind? Are you sure you want to do this? Well, are you listening to God, right? Ask yourself that question. Am I listening to God? Is this what God really wants me to do? Joe, why are you leaving the church? What's wrong with you? Why are you even leaving? That's crazy. God told me I got to go, so I got to go. Well, what is he telling you to do? I don't know. All I know is right now he's telling me I got to go. I can't tell you how many people were like, are you insane? What? Why? I don't know why. God knows why. Maybe he'll tell me when we leave. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, you want to talk about stepping out in some faith on things, right? So, don't let anybody judge you, especially if the Spirit's leading you. Okay? Because why? Because you have the mind of Christ. You have it inside you. He's leading you. They aren't. Don't listen to them. Okay? Ephesians 1, verse 3. So, on spiritual things, we will see that we are spiritually gifted. We have spiritual understanding. We have spiritual help from above. Okay? So, that's what this is about. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been with us, or has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every, every. Did I just say every? Right? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Your spiritual blessings, you see, a lot of times people expect the blessings that are coming from Christ to be coming from material things in the world. Right? Right? But what you have to understand is that when you, when you reach in to the supernatural, into the spiritual realm of things, things are not provided with what you can see here and now. You're reaching into the heavenly places to grab your blessings and pull them in to the here and now. That's why you can't explain them. That's why you can't tell, how in the world did this just line up the way it did? Well, because all those blessings are coming from a place that are pulling strings you can't even see. Okay? So, just understand that. A lot of people want to bank it on, well, if I set this up and that up and this up and that up, well, then where is all the glory and how do you give that to God? That's just you trying to control the situation. You follow? Of course, God's going to give us a sound mind so we make good decisions for ourselves and not set ourselves up for failure, right? Of course, we got to do our due diligence and make sure that we're putting ourselves in the right place at the right time because He said to go. But all those other blessings are being pulled from the outside. Okay, so just as He chose us... In Him, before the foundation of the world, we have been chosen, right? Those who follow Christ wholeheartedly, right, have been chosen. Not everybody understand. And this is one of those, <laughs> right? Not everybody has been chosen for the certain places and things that we are supposed to do, right? Think about it this way. You were chosen for this time. He did not create you until now because now is when He needs you specifically in this time. So you were chosen for this time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hope so. Okay, let's keep going. That we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself. That predestination, that chosen thing, right? Well, the truth of the matter is, what is predestination? Everybody says, well, it doesn't matter if I'm supposed to go to hell. I'm always going to go to hell. No. All of us were predestined from the beginning, but you were chosen for this time. Okay? 
but you decided to go this way. I don't want to live out the destiny that was predestined. I choose different. Follow? So let's not get into the craziness of that. But uh, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us and accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 2, 4. I'm, I'm going to roll through some of these, okay? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up, not apart, but together. We have all been chosen for this time to be together right now. Are you see what I'm saying? And I don't mean like in this room together. I mean to walk it out and do work together on Christ's behalf. You follow? We're supposed to be together. When somebody says, I'm tired of it, I'm leaving. Right? Do you think God predestines people for divorce? Let's, let's look at it that way. Oh, yeah, I went there. I went there, right? No. That's not, that's not where we start. Now, maybe he didn't intend us to be with such and such from the get-go and we decided our own way. But here is the person you were destined for all along. Let's say it that way, right? However, our choices interfere with some of this stuff going on. However, right, we have been raised up together and made us. Now listen. I've chosen you. I've predestined you. That's what he's saying. Now, get up here. It's not a, right, you have accepted Christ, and now you are made. Let's say it, let's say it this way, right? You have been created for this purpose, to come sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He made you from the get-go, created you, get up here. You're supposed to be with me. That's how it was always supposed to be. Are you following? That's pretty intense. Like, poor pitiful me attitude, get it out of your system. That's not who you are. You're supposed to go with boldness to the throne room to sit down with Christ because he said, get up here and sit down with me. That's why I made you was so that we can have a relationship. You're supposed to be here. This was your place all along. That's why I created you. That's why Satan's so jealous. You see what I mean? He wants what God intended for you the whole time. That's why he's been trying to steal from you the whole time. Man has been around. God promised you something. He got jealous. What about me? I've been here ever since. I watched you create these people. Why can't I have my time? That's what Satan's doing. So that rolls right into this, right? So uh, verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Exceeding riches. Not just riches. Exceeding. Exceeds all expectation. Everything you think that Christ is going to do for you, it's greater than that. That's what that phrase is telling you. Okay? All right. So now Ephesians, uh, ooh, yeah, Ephesians 6. So on the flip side of this, here's where Christ wants you is what we just discussed. But here's what's coming against you. There is a spiritual battle happening. We have to recognize that. We have to recognize something's trying to come against us to steal, kill, and destroy. So, verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So, the question is posed a lot of times, does Satan have access to heaven? Well, does he? Revelation 12, verse 7. And, and we've got to look at in, in the nitty-gritty of this, okay? 
But verse 7 says this, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Understand. We're talking about them being in heavenly places, hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. They're out and about. I mean, we got three heavens, okay? We got what you can see, the atmosphere, you got the stars, and then you got the third heaven, which is above all of that, right? Which is the throne room. Now, look at Job, remember Job. First two chapters, what do we see? The accuser approaches in the throne room. Satan comes and approaches the throne room, and he still has access till this day. He's not there all the time. I'll say it that way. I don't believe he is. But God allows him to have his say for a time. But his time is running short because this is coming, right? So just understand that there is a constant argument that God is allowing him to have the opportunity to argue his point against you. God's allowing it for a purpose. You see, all of this accusation, all this stuff that Satan's coming up against you, right, is for what? Why would God even allow it? To make you better. To make you stronger to make you closer to Him. to It's another way for you to point back and go, look, look, Satan, you, you remember when you tried to say this to me and then God came in and said, uh-uh, -uh, that's a lie. Here's what you really are. So we need to see it this way and we need to look at it that way because it produces more faith to go through a hardship with God. If you never have to struggle with somebody. You know, that's what they say about... Uh, that's what they say about couples that go through a traumatic experience together. It's either going to split them apart or they're going to grow so close you can never split them apart. You see what I mean? Thank God I went to Iraq twice with my wife. I'm just saying. It's on camera. <laughs> okay, so now, spiritual things, right? Spiritual understanding. We got to have the Spirit to understand the things in the holy place. So why did we go through all that? We talked about everything in the outer court. You have to receive Jesus, right? And, and then, in order to get to the holy place, we have to immerse ourselves with the Spirit. There is no way that you are going to be able to enter the holy place with understanding Unless you immerse yourself, you are baptized in the Spirit. You fully immerse yourself. You let God reign in your body. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying? It's not a, is it warm? Let me dip my toe. Is it warm in there? Ooh, that's kind of nice. I don't quite know, yo. Maybe just my feet right now. You see what I mean? But that's how a lot of people do it. That's how a lot of people do it. That's okay as long as you keep on, you know, getting down further and further in that water, right? Okay, I'll quit. So I, I wanted to bring this in so we could have a good idea in our mind. What we talked about last week, this outer court, right? Surrounds, okay? And now, understand this. Each one of these is lit a little bit different, okay? The outer court has a natural light. In other places, you can look at it this way. Paul says it this way, first the natural, then the spiritual, okay? We have to come to know Jesus in the natural. There is a natural light, okay? Now, once we have entered the outer court, we have started a relationship with Christ. He then washes us, with the laver, he takes our sin and makes atonement for it, so that what? We may immerse ourselves in the Spirit, and in order to do that, we have to go to the holy place. Okay? So the, here is where we're at. We're talking all things Holy Spirit. We're talking about the things that light us up inside. So we have the golden candlestick. 
table of showbread, and altar of incense. I'm hoping we can get these two today. Okay? So, eventually we'll talk about Holy of Holies next week, I'm hoping, and the Ark of the Covenant, so on and so forth. What does it mean? All, all this, that, and the other. All right? But, Levit Leviticus 16. Oh, yay. Leviticus. <laughs> Starting at verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. They tried to do a profane offering. It was not sanctioned. It was not authorized. It was incorrect. They tried to do the wrong thing. So, what happened? And the Lord said to Moses, we're going to get a little in between the lines. We've got to read in between the lines here, okay? But tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil. Before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Don't come up in here just when you feel like it. And don't do it the wrong way. Or you're going to die. You cannot be. You see, a lot of people think, well, God's just going to kill somebody for coming in there. No, it's not like that. God's trying to say, look, I'm so powerful. If anything that should not be on you is on you. And I'm talking like dirt. We're not even talking about sin. We're talking if you're dirty. Okay. Why? Because they had to wash up and wear these special clothes before they even went in. And then they had to do all the offerings for themselves, and then they could do the offerings for the people. And then, once all of that is done, they could go in. If they didn't do it the right way, if they still had sin on them and in their heart, because they're not doing this the way God ordained, they go in front of his power and his might and majesty and drop dead because evil cannot be in the presence of God and survive. You follow. It's not God killing them. They killed themselves. It's kind of like stepping out in front of a bus. That's a lot of power coming at you. Right? So, uh, the candlestick. So let's talk about it. Exodus 25, verse 31. You shall not make a lampstand, or excuse me, you shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and flowers shall be of one piece. So one big candlestick. Now check this out. They say the thing weighed about 125 pounds. Pure gold. Okay? So why gold? Because it represents the glory of God. Okay? As well, we have a candlestick. Well, what's that for? Well, to provide light in the holy place. As well, it had seven lamps, basically, is what they call it. Seven flames, if you will. Okay? And we're going to see the further we get, the more important this is. Huh? We're going to get there. We're going to get there. 1 John 1. First and foremost, we've got to see it as us. Okay? It is a representation, Old Testament. It is a pointing forward towards what God had for us and to be. So, in John, 1 John 1, starting in verse 1, we got this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. The life that was with the Father and now is manifested to us. We're talking about Christ. Okay. Now, that which you have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the, His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Okay. Let's keep going. Verse 5. 
This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, if we say we are friends with Jesus and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Oh, that's pretty rough. Now, what we're talking about is not stumbling. A lot of people come to this and they go, but what if I mess up? No. We're talking about, that's a bad choice. I like it. <laughs> you see what I mean? There's, there's a difference in that and going, oh, I let my emotions get the best of me. Right? And I made a bad decision in the heat of the moment. God, please forgive me. There's a big difference in that. And give me, give me, give me. Please for, forgive me, Jesus. I'll never do it again. Give me, give me, give me. Right? There's a big difference in that attitude and that, that walk. Right? So, um, but if we walk in the light, so verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So here's what's interesting. You ready? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It comes down to this, right? Some people, I think, they take it in left field and they say, you've got to confess to me. Right? You gotta be held accountable to somebody. Well yeah. But then we did we just read something that says who's gonna judge you? You have the mind of Christ? Who are you confessing to? God. You're going back to him and telling him You're right. I was wrong. I was living by my standard, but you have the standard. I was trying it this way, and now I realize how wrong I was by trying to go down that road. The way I was going about it is wrong. Let me do it your way. You see what I'm saying? There's a big difference in, in, in the way people see this. They want to say, confess it to one another. That's not, Christ is in you. Okay? Now, sometimes it's good to go back to your brother or sister, let's say if you have wronged them, and confess that to them and ask for their forgiveness? Oh, yeah, okay. But we're not talking about every little thing that you confess. No. God, you're right. I'm wrong. You've laid this on my heart. Help me fix it. There's, there's the attitude, right? The attitude God's looking for is, I don't want to be that way anymore. I want to be more like you. See what I mean? Okay, so we are the light of the world, right? So Revelation 1, verse 2. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded... <laughs> what in the world? About the chest. About, oh, thank you. I put a space in there on accident. About the chest with the golden band. Skip on down. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars. So we got Jesus standing amongst all the lamp stands, right? And then down in verse 20, he explains it. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. So the lampstand, to begin with, in the tabernacle, was a light being produced from where? From within the holy place. It was not natural light. It is a light that is coming from within. Are we seeing the symbolism? Are we starting to see, like, okay, the Spirit comes in and starts providing light, and you start producing light. It is not of your own power. It is not your own light. But it is something that has been placed inside you to be lit up in this world. Okay? So, 
With that said, John 9, verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Is Jesus still in the world? You don't write he is because he's inside you. Right? So, you have to start recognizing and, and seeing the symbolism that was being created. God was trying to tell him back then. Right? And he's trying to tell us now. He left us all these clues and breadcrumbs in the Old Testament. Yes, it's boring sometimes. However, there's really cool stuff that's in there. You ever read the Bible and you look at certain things and like, okay, why is he even telling me all this? Why is he even talking about the furniture in the room? What's that got to do with anything? I got furniture in my living room. I got, I got a golden candle holder in my living room or something like that. You know what I mean? But there's purpose behind everything that God put in that book. You got to find it, though. If you don't look for it, well, guess what? Does anybody think this is a little bit cool? A little bit neat? A little bit like, oh, wow. There's a whole lot more to that than I ever thought. Right? So, Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Yet... What are we doing? Listen to what he says right here. And it's so funny to me. Because you watch Christians do this all the time. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are a Christian and people should see that. They should know it. You shouldn't hide it. You should let them know exactly. Well, what is it about you? Well, let me tell you about him and what he is for me. Oh, but uh, you can't say Jesus on TV no more or you're going to get in trouble. You ever see them guys? <laughs> it's, like, it's like they almost make a point just to say his name. And I laugh when I see it because <laughs> they got this deadpan face like on CNN saying Jesus. And it's like you see all the executives. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we lost connection. <laughs> I've seen it. I mean, you got to YouTube some of those. They're pretty funny. <laughs> Somebody just dead face like, hey, I'm just going to tell you right here, right now, that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Oh, 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 sir, uh, you're breaking out. Uh. <laughs> anyway, don't hide it. Do not hide it. The world doesn't want you to spread that, to be lit up by anything but its control. You can't be controlled. You can't have hope of anything else. You've got to be dependent on what? The system. The system, right? The world system, okay? So, the show bread. What time we got? Okay, I'll be quick. So, the show bread, another piece, right? It's a stand. It was made of the acai wood or acai, however you want to say it, covered with gold. All the plates that were there in cups, solid gold. Why? We have sin being covered by God, right? And His glory and His grace. We have a lot of symbolism there. As well, guess what? The bread had to always be present. Always had to have bread. Y'all seeing this? You always had to have the Word present. You always have to have the Word present present in here in here it's in the holy place right mm -hmm. the word is present in the holy place you have the mind of Christ we read that right mm -hmm. always present okay the show bread means presence bread or bread of presence all right if we want to say it the way we do this is direct translation but what it means is it's always in the presence of God. Okay? So, or let's, let's read Exodus 25 real quick. Verse 23. I'm going to read fast. Okay? 
You shall also make a table of a side wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold all around. You shall make for it a frame of hand bread all around, and you shall make a gold molding from the frame all around. You shall make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of a side wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold, and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. Now, there's one thing in here. Pitchers. Pitchers of what? Wine. What is this representation of? The blood, the bread. The communion. It was always to be set before God in His presence. It was a constant reminder of the agreement which was to come, right? That the blood would be poured out and that we would feast on the Word, right? So, blood to cover, bread to feed. We have something where now we have gone within and we are being fed from within. And we are, we are nourished by Christ in us, right? We are strengthened from the inside out at this point because the bread is always present. Do you see what I mean? I will not leave you or forsake you. You have to see it this way. You got to understand it. He's showing us so much in such little things, right? So, Genesis 14, we see something of this nature as well, right? Kind of a representation of what that communion was to look like. Verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedalorimer, and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Y'all seeing this? He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now, that's Abraham giving a tithe to Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek gave him what? Bread and wine. We've got a communion thing happening there, right? So, uh, Revelation 3 verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus just wants to come in and have a meal with you. Right? He wants to feed you. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What the Spirit says. Right? You're not going to understand unless you give in and understand what the Spirit is trying to tell you. If you don't pay attention to that, we're still dipping our toes in the water. Right? And we're not going to understand the things that God has for us in that holy place. To be constantly aware of His presence. Okay? you you got to let yourself go. Because the more you're holding on to you, right? You got one hand on God and got one hand on my life. And you're going to have to let it go. He's moving too fast for you. I promise you that. Okay? But... <clears throat> The communion piece is here as well, right? 
Now, he wants to come in and dine with you. He wants to be in you and dine with you. Right? I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Because he's standing at the door saying, let me in. Let me in. And I think we're going to cut it right there for this evening. We'll get to the altar of incense next week. There's way too much in there. And we'll probably talk Holy of Holies next week as well. I hope you guys are seeing some things and learning some things. There's, there's a lot more to the tabernacle and the way everything was built and how it goes. I mean, I'll give you one. There was uh, on the curtains, right? So before you go in to the Holy of Holies, I, I'm, I'm wanting to say it's from the outer court into the um to the holy place right there was a curtain and on it was cherubim or angels okay and they were sewn into the tapestry okay y'all with that but then you go in the holy of holies and you got two cherubim on top of the ark of the covenant but they're golden they're more real they're more in your face they are more present Where's the veil? Where's the veil? In between. It's in between. And you know how thick that was? That was what, what, oh, it was like... It wasn't no feet. Yeah, it was like feet. <laughs> feet <laughs> thick. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was thick. I'm talking like... Just even think about it this way. Tear a piece of felt one foot thick. Is it possible? Yeah. So when Jesus... Right... When it ripped, it ripped that whole thing from top to bottom. Also a representation of, I'm not locked back here no more. I am present with you always. And right? Right. So, um, the point about the, the angels is, you think about it this way, two-dimensional, now we got a three-dimensional representation. We have a flat surface level mm -hmm. now we have a good length width depth height all that okay so it gets deeper there's more detailed information and understanding to be had the deeper you go with god okay danny close us out sir Heavenly father we come to see in the name of jesus and lord i just thank you for this word that you've given joe and Lord, help each and every one of us to take something from this tonight. And Lord, give us understanding and wisdom about it. And Lord, I just thank you that you're, it says in your word, you'll never leave us or forsake us. So as we go on this uh, rest of the week, I just ask you to pour out blessings on each and every one of us. And we, when we are called to do your work, go do it and do it boldly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.